Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. People like to complain. They complain that they don't have enough time, that it's too difficult to understand, that it's impossible to do, or that something else gets in the way. Worse, when they see another person do it, they heap praise saying, I don't know how you do it. But that's a lie. You do know how. It's not hard at all, and you know it's not hard. You just make different choices. The worst such example is when people avoid what must be done by attempting to justify the importance of something else. For those who make such excuses, the buck stops with the Bible. Nothing is more important than God's teaching. Nothing. I don't mean the teaching you imagine. I am referring to the written text that Jesus keeps quoting within a written text. Nothing can replace it, and nothing can convey it except it. If you are not hearing it, doing it, and sharing it in lieu of every other priority in your life, you do not belong to God. Action, Gandhi once said, expresses priorities. In the Gospel of Mark, the actions of the disciples repeatedly express their disinterest in the teaching of Jesus Christ. They are willing to heap praise on Jesus and eager to join the gossip surrounding Jesus, but they just can't get themselves to crack a book and study the content of his words. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 173 of the Bible as Literature podcast. In Mark, Jesus is concerned when people are preoccupied with signs and wonders. He is frustrated when they look to the sign and the wonder as their reference point, or when they look to him personally as their reference point, as opposed to looking to the content of the teaching. We emphasized last week how the content of Jesus' teaching is everything that was already written. The role of the teacher is to hear and repeat. And the nature of wisdom is that it needs to be repeated because it goes against human nature. The reason it's wisdom is because no one does it, but everyone should be doing it. And the reason no one does it is because it doesn't come naturally to do what is wise. That is why it is a teaching that needs to be repeated over and over again. And the tendency of Jesus to ask people not to talk about him or his miracles is exactly to make sure people maintain the correct focus and the correct priority. I was talking to someone recently from West Africa, and we're talking about the role of the old woman in the community. The old woman has no actual power, but when she catches the young man doing the wrong thing, she can yell at him. And all she has to say is, what would your mother think of this? She can't do anything to him. She's an old woman. But by saying that, it will stop him in his tracks. Your mother taught you the right thing. I'm just repeating what she said. Your mother wouldn't approve of this, and I don't approve of this. This is how the teacher functions. You have heard what wisdom is. You know what wisdom is. I don't need to repeat it. Just go do it now. People who don't think the job of a teacher is to hear and repeat think that the teacher is relevant. But the teacher is not relevant if Jesus in the Gospel of Mark makes himself irrelevant, which is what's really going on when he downplays himself and says, don't talk about this. 
if he's trying to safeguard what is relevant, how can someone tell me that their contribution to the discussion is relevant? It's not. Wisdom is wisdom. It's there. People don't want to accept it because it gets in the way. It's easy for religious people to talk about how it gets in the way of secular society, but they never want to admit how it gets in their way. Because if you are a follower of wisdom, you are not allowed to present yourself as being holy, becoming holy, or a reference for what is holy. It's a very serious matter. Now, when William Reed tries to make this case, we've talked about the Messianic secret before, that Jesus is trying to hide his identity. For him, the smoking gun comes in chapter 9, verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. He sees it as a smoking gun because he thinks that Jesus is playing the crowds and doesn't want word to get out until everyone knows for certain that he's God because he rose from the dead. But this is blasphemy. This is taking the teaching of the Pharisees to its extreme fulfillment in Mark. Because what you're saying is, not only do you need a sign, but you need an absolute sign before you're going to believe what Jesus is teaching. It's incorrect. The reason in verse 9, Jesus tells them not to say anything until after the resurrection, is because he doesn't want them to screw up his teaching ministry. If they blurt it out, they will screw it up. He said several times, don't say anything about what happened, right? But here he says, don't say anything about what happened until. It's different. It's until. Oh, they are going to be able to say something. Awesome. When are they going to be able to say something? What are they going to be able to say? Just by asking that question, we betray what Jesus has been trying to do all along, just like you said, Father. He's been trying to get the teaching out and change the focus away from the wonders onto the teaching itself. We get caught up as listeners, as readers, in the same way as the scholar does, saying, oh, something's different, something's changing. Oh, they will be able to say something at one time. What's that thing? We see that the disciples get very excited, too, because they want to be able to talk about this. They want to be able to talk about what's exciting. They want to talk about it. They want to talk about the miracles and the wonders, and they're wondering, how soon can we do this? Rather than being concerned about the teaching and how do we perpetuate the teaching. They seized upon that statement discussing with one another what the rising from the dead meant. And this is an extremely important verse because Jesus is concerned that they understand the content of the teaching. The crucifixion and the resurrection are the content of the teaching, which they have not understood thus far, which means talking about the sign and the wonder of the resurrection before understanding the content of Jesus' teaching means that the resurrection will be a judgment unto you. But worse, in Mark, it means that people will get distracted and miss the teaching of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see the distraction happening right here, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. Why not discussing with one another what Torah wanted from them? Why not discussing with one another what Jesus had been teaching them? Discussing with one another how to walk in the way that God had laid out millennia before. Immediately, the sign and the wonder is going to get in the way. Then they start contemplating, ooh, 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 you mean he was transfigured now, but he's going to rise from the dead? That's even more awesome. What could that be? I can't wait till that happens. I mean, they want to talk about the resurrection because that's when they get to go and start blabbing their mouths. They want to talk about the resurrection because that's a more even awesome miracle than this transfiguration. They just want awesome and they want to be able to talk about awesome. And that's all that they want. They don't want to get into the nitty gritty of doing the work. This is why it can be so distracting when our minds are always focused on services and not on service. When we think about how am I praying and where do I pray and how good does it look where I pray instead of going out. I was reading an article recently about how awesome it was to hear Pope Francis talk at the Vatican. This was a Catholic writer who said, one thing that Catholics really know is how to create architecture that really speaks to the human soul and it makes one feel uplifted. This is a sin. This is a sin of 
let's go discuss the architecture of the Vatican. Well, let's see what Mark says in chapter 13 about architecture. I mean, come on. Exactly. It's classic idolatry, and everyone's guilty of it because we all look at big and wondrous things, and we get a hormonal reaction, and then we project it onto God. But once you do that, you're constructing a God. You get the hormonal reaction from walking in the woods and seeing a mountain, or you get a hormonal reaction when you see the great domes of St. Basil's or of the Vatican. Or the band at church plays you know, some beautiful song that really speaks to you, and you like it the way you like a song because you're a human being with preferences and emotions and then you have the gall to say it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you? You could only tell if it was the Holy Spirit who was speaking to you if you actually went and served other people. But then the matter at hand is not the music. The matter at hand is serving the others and following what Torah has been teaching you all along. So better to discuss how to serve the needy neighbor than discuss what rising from the dead meant. The thing about verse 10 also is that it's rebellion because he just said in verse 9, please don't talk about it. I'm letting you know because you need to know because you're on the team, but don't talk about it until after it's done. And then I'll tell you what to say about it so that we don't have any problems and the mission doesn't get messed up because work has to keep happening. So they come out of this discussion with Jesus and the first thing they do is they start talking about it. The betrayal, the idolatry, it's there. It's in their action, and it continues in verse 11, Richard. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Why is this a continuation of their betrayal? Because they still don't understand. It just keeps displaying ignorance. We know that John the Baptist came to prepare the way in the wilderness. We know that he is the prophet who is the last prophet who is preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Now, is it actually Elijah? Is John the Baptist a different guy? That question, like their questions here, betrays an ignorance of scripture. Because whether it's Elijah or a different guy, the different guy in this story, John the Baptist, is fulfilling the story of Elijah. He has returned in the content of the prophecy. Now what are you gonna do? And it would be great if they thought that way. But the problem is, they want to know simply so they know, oh, is the resurrection going to come in 10 minutes or is it going to have to be another couple of weeks? Because we're super excited about this resurrection. We just need to know when Elijah is going to come. They're not interested in the content of what Elijah taught, that the idols, the other gods, the Baals, do not have the power that Yahweh has. Don't just stick with that and feel good about yourselves. Stick with that and do what Yahweh says. They're like little children who are missing the entire point because all they want to talk about is what's going to happen to them. We're going to have a birthday party this afternoon, but first we have to clean the house. Ooh, 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 tell us more about the birthday party. No, go clean the house first. And he said to them, Elisha does come first and restore all things, and yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? The first thing Jesus does is rain on their parade. It's beautiful. They're all excited about the resurrection and all the awesome stuff that's going to happen and they can't get enough of awesome. So he says, oh yeah, he's going to come. But first, you're going to be ashamed of me. You're not going to be excited. You're going to be ashamed. And that's what you're going to have to deal with. So let's get over the awesomeness. They're asking about the resurrection and he's talking about suffering and contempt. He tried it before in the last chapter and right. confused the heck out of Peter. This conversation is happening with Peter again. How could he be confused? Jesus took Peter aside, called him Satan, when Peter didn't want to deal with the suffering and the passion. And here, ooh, ooh, tell us more about the resurrection. He's like, actually, I'm going to tell you more about the crucifixion. Thank you very much. The problem is that the priorities of the disciples are incorrect. It reminds me of that famous movie about Herb Brooks where he had all these players from all over the country that all played for their different local teams and they were brought together to play for the American Olympic team. And he made them do a drill where you skate up and down, you know, skate lines. It's like in basketball, when you run up and down the court, they call them suicides or killers. And he kept making them skate, and he kept asking them, who do you play for? And each of the players would state their team from their city, from their state. And he kept pushing them, he kept working them, until finally one of the players realized that his expectation was that they stopped thinking about themselves 
and think about the mission at hand, which is to play for the U.S. team. So one by one, they started to fall off by admitting that they played for the U.S. Olympic team. And once all of them understood this, he ended the drill. This is the point. The disciples are playing for themselves. This is what I'm trying to say. Something big is happening, and they're thinking about what it means to them. And that is incorrect. They should be thinking about the mission. The reason they don't understand Scripture is because they're not making an effort to focus on Scripture. It's not their priority, which means that for them, the resurrection is not good news. That was the point Jesus made when he said, Some of you won't taste death until you see the Son of Man come in power. He's saying that when I am crucified, when I am revealed as the Son of Man on the cross, suffering and treated with contempt, you're not going to recognize me because you're not operating under the correct priorities, which means when the Lord raises me and puts me in a position of judgment at his right hand, you're going to be in trouble. It's not just that he doesn't want to mess up the mission. For their sake, he's saying, don't talk about what you don't understand. You're playing with fire. The beauty of Mark, and I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil the ending here. After Jesus dies and he's put in the tomb, in the short ending of Mark, the original ending of Mark, the disciples never see him again. The last image they get of Jesus is him on the cross, and then he's gone. So you can imagine him resurrected, you can listen to the man in white tell you that he's resurrected. But you never actually get to see him. And when Jesus says, you're going to see me in glory, but they never see him resurrected, we have to then assume that they saw him in glory when he was on the cross, which just confused the heck out of these people because they weren't listening all Well, along. they're looking for a statue, Rich. This is the point I made in my commentary on Galatians when dealing with the empty tomb. It is important that the tomb was carved out of stone. Because that's what you carved temples out of. That's what you carved statues out of. The tomb functions as a metaphor for the temple in Jerusalem, trying to hold the Torah back from the nations on the one hand, but it also serves as a reminder of the anti-idolatry tradition of Scripture. Because you run to the tomb, you don't find a statue carved out of the rock. You find a hollow rock. That's the point. There's nothing there. There's no depiction. The only depiction you are left with in the canonical Gospels is this man, Jesus Christ, suffering and being treated with contempt. That is what you have to contend with. That is what's going on in the proclamation of the crucifixion and the resurrection. This is the meat, so to speak. But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. In other words, if you only read scripture, you wouldn't have to ask me this question. And Elijah wasn't super special awesome. They did whatever they wanted to him. He didn't come with the power of Caesar over Caesar. He wasn't the king of kings coming with a sword and lightning bolts. He came, they did what they wanted with him, and he disappeared. I'm going to be treated with contempt and I'm going to suffer many things. All this awesome, cool stuff you're waiting for, it's not going to happen. So they want Luke Skywalker and the return of the Jedi. Instead, they got a dirty prophet in the wilderness who everyone discarded. No, thank you for bringing up Star Wars because Luke in Empire Strikes Back was looking for somebody awesome and cool with a lot of power and was insulted that this little green guy, Yoda, was supposedly some kind of Jedi master who was being treated with contempt by the Empire and was living in a swamp, barely subsisting, trying to stay out of everybody's way, with snakes and bugs crawling through his house and he's eating bugs. They treated Yoda however they wanted to treat him and he was irrelevant and he was gone and then he finally dies and just and literally disappears. He did not die a glorious death, he was treated with contempt at the end. The notion that Jesus is trying to impress so hard is that the human being will be distracted by signs and wonders. We always want to say that the signs and the wonders, whether it's some form streaking through the heavens or simply nice singing on Sunday morning or a beautiful painting in a church, 
These are all going to be distractions because this is what we're going to discuss. Instead, we need to be focusing on taking care of the other. Now, we can say, well, if these great things inspire us to take care of the needy neighbor, aren't they then good? Does the end justify the means? The only thing you can judge by is, do you do the right thing or not? Well, Paul says it's yes and no. It's a contradiction. Paul answers your question in Romans because he says, look, because the Jews sinned, the gospel was preached to the Gentiles, meaning God uses your sin for a good purpose. For God, the ends definitely justify the means. The ends is the preaching of the gospel and everyone loving each other. But at the same time, even though the ends justify the means, you're not off the hook for your sin. Yes, the ends justify the means, but you're never justified. That's the point. Thanks very much, Dr. Benson. Have a great week. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.